uh, first of all, uh, let's see, Halloween, the, the crew was out there on Halloween this week, uh, giving out candy and saying hey to folks. Uh, I have a, a card to read, and I'll read that, and then if anybody would like to share anything, you can share, okay? All right, so this is, uh, this is from uh, Robin and the crew about Halloween night. So Hardison Church family, you are amazing. I will back that up, actually. Your commitment has shared God's love with our community. Your 9,128 pieces of candy, but each count, that's awesome, became 4,000 trick-or-treat bags, and each bag contained candy, a church flyer, and one of Phil's crosses. Every one of those bags is now in the hands of our community. God's presence was felt. Your Bible, four Bibles, and four gifts of Jesus. Is that the word, is that the word I'm looking at? Four Bibles and four gifts of Jesus books were passed. Yeah. Four Bibles and four gifts of Jesus books were passed. There are touching heartfelt stories of prayers and personal witness. God's blessings for each of you that donated, volunteered, or prayed over this ministry. So how about a hand for God for that? <laughs> Anything else to say on that? Anything you'd like to share on that? Oh, you know there is. <laughs> Thank y'all for everything you did. If you came, if you
years. And, and, well, and as soon as I walked up there, before we even got the tent up, we were all talking. I said, the Holy Spirit here, I can feel him. I mean, he filled that place up. Not just our little place, he filled that place up. So, thank y'all so much. I, my heart goes out. Woo! Yeah! That's what we're called to do. That's why we do stuff like that. That's why we work hard. Is we're called to be a light that shines in the darkness, and darkness will not overcome it. That's written somewhere, and that's pretty good stuff, right? All right. Uh, so thank you guys. Thank everybody who helped behind the scenes and in front. God was moving, and we're going to pray that He continues to move with everybody that was talked to out there. Yep. Uh, so also, I have uh, I have a note here, a thank you note, another thank you note, for the church. Uh, Hugs would like to thank everyone who's given us a donation for our Moxville Senior Living Christmas Party and Christmas gifts. This cause is dear to all of our hearts, and as you know, we are totally self-sufficient using our own money and an occasional fundraiser to do the things we do. We're proud of that, and we've been a group for over 10 years. Special thank you. Special thank you to the gentleman that visits Hardison's, Hardison occasionally and volunteered to buy baby dolls for all the ladies in the Alzheimer's Memory Care Unit, which will make them very happy. Also, Anyone that would like to join us for the event, we would love to have you. It's scheduled for Wednesday, December 18th at 10 at uh, 2 o'clock. <laughs> and if, uh, if you didn't uh, get all of that, that note will be up here. You're welcome to just grab it or snap a picture of it after. Uh, one more announcement. A lot of you asked for Brandon's address. I've got that here. We'll put that in uh, the bulletin next week and the email. So Brandon Durham's address. Any other announcements? It will be on the bulletin board. And it is on the bulletin board. We will we'll be on the bulletin board as well. Thank you. I am still working on that updated edition of our church family directory. I had lots of interruptions, and I'm sorry for that, but also happy for that. Yeah. Um, I have found several people that are not still getting their church emails. And if you're one of those, just let me know, and I'll get it fixed up. There you go. See BJ in the back if you want an email. Or if you don't want an email, see her and let her know. So it's not like one more thing in the inbox. That's okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, as, uh, also, just a special thank you from our family. We feel extremely loved this week. Thank you for that. Uh, you're good at that. Any other announcements? Play practice at 4. Today. Play practice at 4 today. So be here. And if you don't have a spot in the play, we can absolutely find you a spot. Alright. You, you can get a spot in the play today. Show up. This could be your big break. You can be a star yes. today. Alright. Anything else? Any other announcements? Alright, let's pray. Well, Lord, you're here in this place and we say just keep on coming. Father, just fill our hearts up uh, and just tie us together as one family with one father. Father, no matter where our hearts are this morning, no matter how we've come in. Uh, let shame and guilt and regret stay at the doorstep. And Father, just fill us up as your children today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and you can sing as the light of Christ comes into the room.
Well done. 
and for Tiffany and everybody being in great shape. Yes? Awesome. Hey, 
got a, a lot of life, a lot of life happening, a lot going on, and you are the God of all that. And so, Father, as we come into this place today and as we continue to worship and you continue to fill our hearts and you continue to draw us together, we pray that that would just keep coming. And, Father, we pray that that would keep coming in light of who you are. Father, that you care about every single need that was spoken here today and that was unspoken here today. You know the need on every heart in this place. And, Father, you know the need on every heart for the folks who couldn't make it today. So, Father, we lift up those needs before you. You heard everyone, and you're so familiar with everyone, and you said just that. And so, Father, we lay those needs and those prayers and those praises and those joys and concerns, we lay them all at the foot of the cross. And we ask, Father, that, that you would just take those and you would move in the way you see fit. And, Father, we would ask that we would grow in the process. That you would move in our hearts and our minds and transform us and change us to see you more clearly and to grow in love for you. Father, I thank you for the family that is in this place today. We thank you for your spirit that guides all in this place today. And we would ask that you would just meet us and show us your glory and your grace. And that we would walk out with a peace and an understanding and an assurance of a Heavenly Father who loves us endlessly and unconditionally. Father, we thank you and we ask that you just keep moving and we lay it all in your hands. And we ask these things in the name of Christ our Savior. And all God's children who agreed said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship with children's time. If the uh, April will come up and any kids who'd like to come to come up. We will see an example of 
Transform, the transforming power of Jesus. Many years ago, there was a man named Saul. He was an enemy, or he was against the church. So he didn't like the church, okay? He, was, he hated the church. And he did many terrible things to the followers of Jesus. He was mean to people that believed in Jesus. He was even part of a group that stoned a man named Stephen. So he threw rocks and he killed a man named Stephen because he was preaching about Jesus. One day, Saul was traveling to the city of Damascus to hunt for Christians so that he could have them thrown into prison. So he really didn't like them. On the way to Dam Damascus, a bright light appeared and Saul heard the voice of Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why do you hate my people so much? Saul answered, Who are you, Lord? Jesus replied, I am Jesus, whom you are against, who you're per persecuting. I have appeared to point you, to appoint you as my servant and to be a witness for me. After that meeting with Jesus, Saul's life was transformed, changed. In fact, he even got a new name. From that day on, he became known as Paul instead of Saul. And instead of trying to destroy the church, he went from town to town preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. People were amazed at the change that took place in Paul's life. Wherever he went, people said to him, the man who once persecuted or, were against, or was against the church and persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. That is what the transforming power of Jesus can do. Wouldn't you like to let Jesus change your life? Yeah. Let us pray. And I got a candy that's going to transform your mouth. <laughs> it will change. It will make your mouth change colors. I know for a fact. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to feel the transforming power of Jesus in our life. So we pray that you let it be so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. goodness and your kindness. And Father, we thank you for the fact you never give up on us. And Lord, we would ask that uh, during this time of tithes and offerings that you would continue to work on our hearts, that you would continue to uh, show us how good you are as we trust you. And we ask that you use these gifts to show others how good you are if they'll trust you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>
God is meant to be enjoyed. He is meant to be the delight of your heart. You guys know, if, if you know me, you know I've got a thing for Volkswagens. I enjoy Volkswagens. I've had a Volkswagen most of my life. That started early because my uncle was a Volkswagen mechanic, so it was a way to get free labor. And my dad was all about free labor. <laughs> and so, so I, I've just gotten, I've gotten fond of Volkswagens over the years. I usually drive a Volkswagen. And uh, 20 plus years ago, I was driving a Volkswagen Rabbit. And I had bought it one evening. My former Volkswagen had broken down, and we drove it until the wheels fell off. So it was just set aside to get another one. So I went out and I found one in a dealership. It was evening, and it was this looked like navy blue Volkswagen Rabbit. And I went out and I bought it, drove it for a test drive. It had all the good Volkswagen <laughs> stuff. It smelled like a Volkswagen. It kind of has a certain smell to a Volkswagen. All the little lights, the little tones, the, the, the chimes and all that, straight up Volkswagen. So I drove that navy blue Volkswagen off the lot that evening, and that morning I found out when the sun hit it, it was more like a purple, kind of a, not a navy blue Volkswagen. And so that was, that was one thing. But it ran great, and I couldn't, I mean, it wasn't like a 24-hour guarantee at the place I bought it. It was like, you walk off the lot, that's your car. And so it, it ran good, and I thought, well, you know, it runs well, and I'll drive it. So I drove it for about a week, and then I got my first traffic jam. And I realized that when it's sitting still, it doesn't run so good. And you could watch that temperature gauge just, ooh, just raise up, and it would overheat when you stood still. And you stood still for more than like five minutes at a time. And at the time, I was driving out 40 a lot, and I was driving toward Greensboro a lot. And uh, kind of right there at the Quarry Convention Center and Four Seasons during that time, 20 plus years ago, you were bound to get in a traffic jam, right? And so I would pull up and I'd get in the traffic jam and I would begin to watch, you know. I'd watch that temperature gauge hold steady and then after a few minutes of sitting still, I'd watch it kind of get in the red zone. And I would start making my escape plan, right? Because the last thing you want as a young 20s male to be stuck with an overheated engine in your purple Volkswagen on the interstate port. Right? And so I would start, uh, I would start looking for my escape route. Right? I would say, all right, always be in the right lane. You get on the shoulder, shut it down, give it time to cool off, get back. I found out if you turn the heat up full blast, that would help. Right? So in July, got all the windows down and I'm sweating and the heat's going full blast to try and keep it cool. And, uh, and I would always, I would just sit and I would watch that temperature gauge because I didn't have, so like, there were a couple problems with the Volkswagen. Number one, it was purple. Number two, it would overheat. And number three, I couldn't afford to fix any of that, right? And, uh, and so I would just sit and I would watch that temperature gauge and I would just kind of get anxious. You know, the longer we sit, the more anxious I would get. And I would say, all right, well, here, I'm in the right lane. Here's my spot out, you know, or maybe shut it down, whatever. And so over the years, I drove that for a few years. And over the years, it just got to be something I would plan for. I would plan for it to overheat. And, uh, and I would plan escape routes. And I would sit and I would just, I would be sitting behind the wheel and I would watch that thing. And this was before, I, well, it wasn't before cell phones, but it was before I had a cell phone. And uh, so I, did, I would keep a book in the car, candy, and I would just uh, pull over to the side of the road and have a little me time, right? And, uh, and just read a book or take a nap, because I've been known to take a nap anywhere at any time, right? But over the years, I just got kind of conditioned to that. Watch the temperature gauge. Wait for it to overheat. Shut it down. And that was 20 plus years ago. Now since then I've had new cars. Right? I've had uh, new to me cars and even a drive off the lot car. And do you know what I do every time I go somewhere in a vehicle? If I'm stuck in traffic, even 20 years later, you know what I do? I watch that temperature gauge. Because I'm conditioned, like in an awful way, I have like temperature gauge PTSD. And I walk. I'll be able to stop that and I watch. Because I'm just waiting for it to overheat. Now, one of those cars we had was a, was a minivan and it had like that keyless entry. And, uh, and I wasn't used to that. It, it also like ran very smooth and quiet and it had keyless entry. So, you know, you didn't have to have your key in the ignition, right? You know, keyless entry. You guys all have keyless entry. You didn't have to have your key in the ignition, just leave it in the car. And there were plenty of times I would get out of that van and go in somewhere and eat, like order from a menu eat, and just leave that thing running because I didn't take the key out and I'd come back out and it would just be running for like an hour. It never overheat. But every time I would take it somewhere, I would watch for that temperature gauge to go up. And you see, the thing was, is the new car wasn't the old car. 
but I treated the new car like I did the old car. And because I kept waiting for the new car to do what the old car did, I couldn't enjoy the ride in the new car. You see, I was, I've been driving something different for a while. The radiator's good and it won't overheat. But I'm still so scared and I watch that temperature gauge. Now we're going to be in the book of Galatians today. We're going to start chapter 1. We're going to take kind of a 10,000 foot view. We're just going just to do a whole chapter today. But what Paul is writing about in the book of Galatians is you have this new life. And you shouldn't treat it like your old life. Because your old life, you kind of had to wait and watch and be anxious about some things. But this new life, you get to be free and enjoy the ride. In this new life with Christ, if you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus, can I just tell you something that's going to sound totally irresponsible? If you've given your heart to Jesus, there are some things you don't have to worry about anymore. You should be riding free. And you should let the wind go through your hair or at least across your scalp. <laughs> and you should enjoy the ride. But that's not how we operate. We don't operate like we enjoy the ride. We operate like there's a temperature gauge that we should be watching. Do you enjoy your life with God? Psalm 37, 4 said, My delight is in the Lord. Uh, Philippians says, Rejoice. I'll rejoice in Jesus Christ. Uh, Psalms again says, I'll follow God and be joyful. I'll, be, I'll have a heart of gladness. Romans says I'll rejoice in Jesus Christ. See, this, this isn't me saying you should be happy and rejoice. This is the Bible saying that you should be happy and rejoice in God. But that's not the way we operate. We operate in this new Christian life. We give our lives to Jesus and we have this new life and we operate in such a way where we wait and we watch and we work to try to earn what's been given to us. And Paul is going to lay out this context in Galatians where some people are messing with his people. And he wants them to know that they're free. So let me ask you before we get into this book, do you enjoy God? Or is God just something that you check the box for and hope that you get to heaven and you hope against hope that you get it right enough to get to heaven, but you're just not so sure. And what if I could mess it up? If, if that's where you're at. And, and that's a common place to be in. But if that's where you're at, this book is going to be for you. Because you don't have to wonder about those things. And guess what? Can I tell you something super scandalous, super, super edgy? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can't screw it up. You're not powerful enough to screw it. If you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, you know what he said on the cross? It is started? No. It has begun? No. I started it so they can finish it? No. He said it is finished. To tell us that. Paid in full. Your debt is paid. And so if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, and you said, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. You are assured and secure in that relationship. And, and you may say, well, what about the work? Like, shouldn't I do some work? Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get to that. But you can't understand the work until you understand the grace. And so, so what I want you to come away from here today with is, is do you enjoy God? Because God's worth enjoying. And if you are not enjoying God, you are missing the picture. But I got good news. <laughs> I got good news. It's not too late and you can't. Right? Do you enjoy God? I, th I think a lot of us treat God like a diet. Right? Like, like we, we approach a diet and we say, well, I need to lose some weight. Okay. Right? I'm not in great shape. 
I run out of breath getting up the steps. I, I, need to, I need to go on a diet. So we go on a diet and we say, well, everything I used to love, I no longer get to enjoy. <laughs> right? All the good stuff out of here. Right? And everything I hate to eat, I now have to eat. Do you know a lot of us, that's our relationship with God. A lot of us approach God that way. We say, all oh, the things I used to love to do. You ever talk to a Christian and they talk way more about their old life than they do their new life? And they're like, yeah, I used to go out there and have a party all night and it's crazy times. <sighs> and then I met Jesus. <laughs> and now I'm well, that's, that's not that, That's not the way it works, actually. Right? But that's the way a lot of us approach it. We approach it like a diet. Like everything I used to love, I now gave up. I, I now give up and I don't get to enjoy those things anymore. And everything I hate, I now do. But it's for the glory of God. I'm going to be in heaven. I'm cranky as heck right now. But I'm going to be in heaven. That's not the way it works. You know why? Because you were created by a God who also created enjoyment and delight. And when you get to know that God who created that enjoyment and delight in your heart, you get to realize that He is the source of that delight and that joy. And that no matter what comes your way, there can be enjoyment and assurance and peace and delight. We're going to see that as we unpack this book. You know, you, you think about the, the verses I read. You know, my delight is in, the, is in the Lord my God, and He will give me the, the desires of my heart. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. I delight in my Lord Jesus Christ. I delight in God. You, you read those verses. And even remember, we just finished the book of Mark. And remember Mark 1, 1, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. I know that was a long time ago. But remember what it says? This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Does it sound like good news to say everything I used to love, I gave up? That sounds like, that sounds like terrible news. Does it sound like good news to say, I guess I'll do what God wants? That's awful news. And so if you feel that way about God, like if you feel like, like Christianity is a chore or a burden, or a checklist of things you need to do, you're missing it. There's more. There's more. And it is a joy that soaks down into your soul and in your heart and that overflows from within you. That's what a relationship with Jesus looks like. But too many times Christians look like they've been sucking on lemons all day long. I love Jesus. Stop <laughs> Don't tell me. We don't want everybody else to know you're one of us. There should be a joy within you. Right? See? See? And we're, we're going to... How, how you doing? Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> DJ voice. Oh, uh, welcome to Hearts Church where we spend the uh, fat tracks on flat wax. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's this joy. Within, right? You read Mark 1.1 1, 1, that says, man, this is the beginning of the good news of the gospel. You read the gospels. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you watch Jesus walk around with people. You watch God put on flesh and walk around as Jesus Christ and interact with people. There's joy there. People are drawn to Him. Children are drawn to Jesus. And he says, don't stop the kids from coming to me. Let the children come to me. Do you know kids don't come around with grumpy people? There's this joy in Jesus that people are drawn to. And we get to watch that in the Gospels. And you see that. And you've got to say, man, the way I'm living as a Christian is not joyful. So what am I missing? There's more to this thing, right? But see, we think, we think Christianity, this relationship with God, is something we've got to do. It's something we have to do. It's something we have to check the box and make sure we complete the list of. And, and... What if I sin too big and mess it up? Can you be honest in your heart right now and, and think about this? Like, okay, I became a Christian a while back, but everybody else in here doesn't know the thing I've been doing. You don't have to raise your hand right now. But we know you. We see you. Not really. Huh? But, but a lot of us, 
We say, man, I've been a Christian for a long time. What about the sin? What about the sin that keeps coming up in my life? Have I blown it with God? Like, see, we picture it, we picture it like the Godfather cartoon. If you're not a Godfather person, just bear with me for a minute. But if you're a Godfather person, we can hang out later. Right? But it's Godfather cartoon. That's how we picture our relationship with God, right? When Michael comes to Fredo, and Fredo betrayed him, and Michael gives him the kiss of death, and he says, I knew it was you, Fredo. And by the way, you're dead to me. You're nothing to me. You're not my brother anymore. You're not my friend. I don't want to see you at the hotels. I don't want to see you at the, my home. If you visit our mother, I want to know a day in advance so I don't come near you. You're dead to me. That's how we think our relationship with God is if we sin. We think if we sin too big, God will say, See, you did. That's not true. And you know, Christians don't want to admit it, but we still sin. We still mess up. When Christ died on the cross for our sins, He died from our, for our sins from birth to death, everything in between. From Adam's sin in Genesis and Eve's sin in Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation. They were all nailed to the cross. So the sins you did before you met Jesus, died on the cross if you've given those up to Jesus. The sins you did this morning, died on the cross. The sins you do that you don't even know about, died on the cross. That's how big grace is. Grace is big enough to cover all of your sins. Now, should you keep living in your sins? No, crazy. That's making you miserable. Get rid of that stuff. It, it's going to get in the way of, of, of your vision of God and it's going to screw up your life. That's why I called it a sin. So, so kick it to the curb. Repent of that stuff. And lay it at the foot of the cross because it's killing you. But does it make God love you less? No. Nope. And so your life as a Christian lived in Jesus Christ is this continual walk. Is this continual walk where you're, you're, you're growing closer to Christ and you see God more clearly. And then in the light of God, you see the depth of your sin. And you say, I don't want that in my life anymore. Would you take that away? Yes, John. Let's get rid of that. See, that's, that's not the way we live. We're scared. And, and we watch. And we worry. And we wait in our Christian life anxiously while we feel like the temperature gauge of our spiritual life gets dangerous. And we're not enjoying the ride because we're so anxious that we might mess up what God's done for us. And here's our reaction when we do that. We say, well, I've done a lot of bad, so I need to work hard and do a lot of good. I need to earn this thing back. As we unpack this book, we're going to talk about the place for Christian work. Because there is a beautiful place for it, and it's important, and it's part of growth. But you can't understand the importance of Christian work until you understand the treasure of grace. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that today. So this book, Galatians chapter 1. If you got a Bible turn there, if not, don't worry about it. We'll talk through it. Do you enjoy God? Right? See, see what Paul's about to get into with this letter to the church in Galatians, what he's about to get into is there's this church that Paul started, and he's writing them this letter because he heard that people were messing with this church. And there's this group called Judaizers that had started messing with this church. And this group called Judaizers, you know, most of the early Christians were Jews. A lot of the early Christians were Jews who, who then believed in Christ. And so they were these Jewish Christians and these beautiful people, right? But, but there was this group called Judaizers who said all of these old laws still apply. So in other words, all the things we used to have to do before Christ became our ultimate sacrifice still apply. One in particular is, is what this book is about, is circumcision. Now, if you don't know what circumcision is, 
Ronnie Couch is in the back, and he'll explain that to you after the service. <laughs> He's got charts and diagrams and everything. <laughs> All right, second uh, if you do know what circumstances is, then roll with me, and if you don't, ask your parents later. Okay. All right, parents, you're on the hook. Okay, so, but it was this deeply personal act, and it separated. It was it was kind of God's God's uh, action to to His children back in the Old Testament. Where, where God kind of said, you're a separate people. This is unlike anything else. So it was this deep, deeply personal act, applied only to the males, obviously. And it was this deeply personal act that God said, you need to do this to show everybody else you're separate from the world. Right? Now, we don't have to do that anymore. You're welcome to do that. But you don't have to do that anymore. Right? Because well, it's the same reason we don't sacrifice lambs on Passover. The same reason we don't sacrifice goats and we use scapegoats. It's because Christ is the one sacrifice for all time and He covers all that. He's the fulfillment of every law in the Old Testament. So Christ fulfilled all of it. Right? But there's this group called the Judaizers and they come to this little church in Galatia and they say, oh, you accepted Jesus. You guys are under the teaching of Paul. That's great. Super news. Now, here's what you need to do next. You need to be circumcised. You know in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Anytime somebody says, here's also what you need to do. Woo! 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 No. Anytime somebody says, great, you're a Christian. You've accepted Jesus. Now, in order to be a real Christian, no. No. Jesus. Just Jesus. And Paul felt so strongly about this. And you'll see this when we unpack this. Paul felt so strongly about this that this book is like no other book. So he begins, he begins a lot of letters like to the Philippians and, and to Corinthians. When you read this, I want you to this week read Galatians chapter 1. Read through it in light of what we're talking about. When, when he writes this book, like, it's different from the rest, because in the other books, he's like, hey, church that I love, I remember when you were with me from the beginning, and, and, and we, we started this thing, and you guys are such a treasure to me, and I value, and say hey to such and such, and say hey to say I love you guys. And when he started this book, he was like, hey, this is Paul, this is who I am. What are you guys doing? That's basically what he says. He's like, what are, you, what are you doing? You don't add things to Jesus. It's not Jesus plus an accomplishment that you need to do. It's just Jesus. And so he starts this book, and I'm telling you, this is a, it's a radical book, it's a scandalous book, and he starts this book because these Judaizers are coming into town, and they're saying, hey, uh, great you accepted Jesus, but also there's this. Does anybody remember that show, Extreme Home Makeover? Hey, bus driver, move that bus. Does anybody remember that, right? These Ty and these, this crew of people, they would come in back in the day and, and these people would be living in this little bitty house and they would come in and secret, like secretly organize a total home renovation. And so they would come and they would take that family somewhere and they would completely, like they would take the two bedroom house and make it a 20 bedroom mansion and there would be like these kids themed rooms. So they found out this kid liked reptiles so they put like 30 reptile cages in his room. Pretty, right? Then there was this uh, kid who liked duct tape, so they made like a whole room out of duct tape, a duct tape bedspread. Also, right? like, that's cool when you're that age, but like, when it gets to be, yeah, yeah. right? And so, so they would take these things and they would do these crazy. They put a jacuzzi in a room, right? All these crazy things, right? And so, so the band would be on vacation, and the whole community would come, and they would renovate the house. It was this really beautiful thing, right? They would renovate the house. And all these people would donate their time. And then they would park a bus in front of the house. And they'd bring the family in. And he'd say, hey, bus driver, move that bus. And they'd move the bus. And the family would see the house. And the music would swell in the background. <laughs> and they'd get to move just right. And they'd focus in on the tears. And, Whoa! and, and look, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Like, it's a pretty awesome thing, right? Like, so legit. That was a cool gift, right? But they would see the house. And everybody would go crazy. And they'd go in there explore it. Awesome. You know, years later, they found out some of the families had trouble with the big houses, like their property taxes, their power bills, like all of a sudden you got 60 koozies in the house. 
like the power mills, and they had trouble keeping up with the beautiful gift they had been given. If, if you had 30 reptile cages in your kid's room, we have one hamster cage, and we can't keep it cleaned out regularly, right? Like, like it came with some work. Right? And so there was good news, you got a new house. But then there was others like, you got to work really hard to keep it up. And a lot of us live a Christian life like that. If we give our lives to Jesus. We realize the magnitude of our sins. And we're about to crack this thing open. I know that's late for us to start Scripture. And don't worry about we're not going to look at every verse in chapter 1. You'll make it to lunch. Okay? But you need to understand the background of this thing. But a lot of us live like that with extreme home makeover mentality. Is we realize the magnitude of our sins and we realize we need a Savior. And so we say, Jesus, save me and forgive me of my sins. And Lord, I want to follow you for the rest of my life. And it's like, yeah! And I told you about my experience when I was 15. I gave my life to Jesus and I was so excited. I was running laps around the bed. I was like, hey, bus driver, move that bus. Woo! And it was awesome. But then a lot of us, over time, we start to lose that joy and we start to replace it with this burden that doesn't need to be there. Okay, Jesus is great, but I better live like it now. And I better start making sure everybody else sees that I live like it now. And over time, a lot of us, if we're not careful, our focus becomes on the outside things instead of the only thing that matters, which is Jesus. So Paul hears about this, and he hears that some joy is being sucked out of his little church in Galatia. And so Galatians chapter 1, Paul writes to this little church. And I, I want to stress again what a big deal this is to Paul. That people are adding to the gospel. Because you'll see four things here in chapter 1. You'll see Paul stating his authority. You'll see that this book is an anomaly. It's different. You'll see that Paul is annoyed. <laughs> and then you'll see the acceptance of God for his people. So you've got these, these, these four things, authority, anomaly, annoyance, acceptance. And so you see right off the bat, authority. Paul, Galatians, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. So in other words, Paul's starting this letter and he says, Hey, church, remember who I am? I'm an apostle. And so we're all disciples, we're all followers of Jesus Christ. But then there are apostles, right? And so there are apostles who... Uh, you have like the, the 12 apostles, right? Judas out, right? But you have the 12 apostles. But then you have other people named as apostles because apostles were sent. They were sent. They were people sent for the gospel. But Paul says, I'm not an apostle from man. I'm an apostle from God. So you have these apostles who are responsible for writing much of the New Testament and, uh, and miracles given through, right? And so you see these apostles. Paul says, I'm an apostle. You see that in verse 1? And then we're not going to read through it, but verses 10 through 24, the rest of chapter 1, Paul says, in case you forgot who I am, I'm giving you the word of God. Straight from God to you. And so he says, as you read this tonight, verse 1 and 10 through 24, Paul stating, I have some authority to tell you what I'm about to tell you. Now, that's a little different from the rest of his books. Paul spends a lot of his time stating his authority so that he will say, what I'm about to tell you is important because you are missing grace. And then we mention an anomaly, like Paul is urgent, and, and, and it's not so much what is said here, but it's what not said, what's not said. Like if I had started today's service, if I had come in here this morning, and I had said, hey, good morning, church, what are you doing? I saw what you did this week. We need to fix things. You would see some urgency. And Paul's basically writing his letter like that. Like that, right? And then you see in verses 6 through 9, let's read that. He's annoyed. <laughs> Verse 6. I am astonished. I'm appalled. That you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. And turning to a different gospel. You're going to see different in here a couple times. Contrary, 
Right? And what he means is some of your versions say perverse. What it means is opposite. In other words, you're following a gospel that is opposite what the true gospel is. You're turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be a curse. What he just said was that word a curse, let him go to hell. That's what he said. That's a curse. And what he said was, if an angel from heaven tells you this, let it be a curse. There are some religions today where they claim an angel from heaven gave a revelation. And Paul says right here, if an angel tells you something different from this gospel truth that Christ died for you, let it be a curse. It's a big deal. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone's preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let it be a curse. What did they receive? Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus Christ lived a life that you could not live so that he could die a death that you could not die. And he could pay a death that you could not pay. That's the gospel. So when you realize the weight of your sins and you give that over to Christ, that's the gospel. And then there is acceptance. Verse 4. Jesus who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom glory and forever Amen. So Paul says, and this is, I want you to read chapter 1 tonight. I want you to go over it. I want you to look for his authority and God's acceptance and Paul's annoyance <laughs> and the urgency. Right? But, but before, we, before we unload on this book, before we just tackle what's going on in this book, I, I want you to understand the importance of the grace. And that it's not your pastor up here saying, this is my take on grace. And it's not your pastor up here saying, it's an easy life, Christians. Just, just come on board. You don't have any worries. But that it's the word of God saying you are loved with an everlasting love. And it was not a cheap grace, but you were bought at a price. And then if you've given your heart over to you, that you're his forever. Now we say around here, one thing we say around here is the best way to unpack the Bible is with the Bible. Right? And so for the perfect example is you look at Luke 15. If you look at Luke chapter 15, you see this story that Jesus told the prodigal son. It's the most beautiful example of grace in the whole Bible. Right? Because you remember that this father and the father represents who? Our father. God. This father had two sons and the kids represent who? us. His father had two sons. He was a pretty wealthy guy. Right? Luke chapter 15. He was a pretty wealthy guy. And one day his younger son comes to him and says Dad, I would like the inheritance today. I would like my share of the inheritance today. Pretty bold request. Yes? Yes. Dad, I'd like my share of the inheritance today. Now, if my youngest son came to me and said I'd like my share of the inheritance today, I could just reach in my pocket and hand him whatever I got in my pocket. Good, Good luck with it. But in this case, the young son came and he said, Dad, I would like my share of the inheritance today. His father said, okay. He took his share of the inheritance and then he did what? He got out of town, baby. He rode to a city and it said he squandered his wealth on women and wild living. Right? That's what we would say. And that's pretty much what the Bible says, right? As he squandered his money on everything in sight. And he squandered it and he didn't have any money left and he felt too guilty to come home and he was living in shame and it says what? He started eating with the pigs. He came home as a hired hand at a local farm. He didn't have any money so he would eat pig slop. He was dirty and nasty. And he said, man, I could live better than this as a servant back home. As a servant back home. So he said, I'll ask my dad to forgive me at least enough to just be a servant because I know I can't be a kid anymore. And so he starts to walk back home and on the way back home he's rehearsing his speech. You ever been there? Hey dad, I know I messed up. <clears throat> really big this time. I don't deserve your love but if you'll just... Let me work. Be a servant. I'll take that. But 
then that story says what? On his way home, his father looked and saw him at a great distance. What does that mean? That means his father was looking for him. His father was waiting for him. The father is who? Church? God. God. His father was waiting for him to come home. His father was looking for him. And so the father does what? Runs. The father runs out to his son. That's a big deal because in that culture, dignified men did not run. And you can think because the father's not wearing a tracksuit, right? He's wearing a robe. And men, maybe we don't know what it's like to run in a robe, but women, you run in a dress. Like in the Olympics, you don't see that. You don't see like people wearing dresses to do the, to do the sprints. Because that's tough. So he hikes up his robe and runs to his son. Totally undignified. And he runs to his son. And you check me tonight. You read Luke 15. The son begins to apologize. The son says, well, I'm going to cheat because I'm just going to go there. All right? The son begins to apologize. Luke 15, verse 21. And the son said, the father came and he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. The son hadn't said a word yet. The father ran and embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to the father, just like he rehearsed, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. You want to know what the father did? Did the father say, it's about time, I got an apology? Did the father say, thank goodness you feel that way, now we can move forward? This is Jesus' story, not my story. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, <laughs> bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. The father didn't say, thank goodness you apologize. The father said, I, you were apologizing, but hey, treat him like a king. He's a child of mine. So we think we mess up. That God's just sitting in heaven with his arms crossed and he's angry. And we've blown him. Can I tell you something? Super dangerous. Like a lot of you may have been away from God for a long time. Here's what I mean. Maybe it's been a long time since you prayed. You have a father who loves you. For a lot of you, it may have been a long time since you spent some time in the Bible. You have a father who loves you. For a lot of you, it may have been a long time since you just opened your heart to Him. You have a Father who loves you. For a lot of you, it may have been a long time since you sat down and you had a conversation about Jesus with one another. You have a Father who loves you. See, that's what Paul founded that church on. And other people were coming in and they were saying, yeah, you got a Father who loves you, but you need to earn it. You need to make sure you do the check. And Paul said, no. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. And as we unpack this book, as we unpack this book of Galatians, this letter to this church, that's what you're going to see word for word. That's what you're going to see line for line. Is you have a Father who loves you. And will sin wreak havoc in your life? Yes! Let me tell you something biblical again. Sin sucks. It's awful. It will. It be, you know why I use that word? Because it will suck the joy out of your life. It will create a vacuum that just... Substitute right after that. Sin's awful. Is your sin too big for God? No. Nope. You have a father who loves you and is waiting to embrace you and kiss you and bring you home. Last thing. Last thing. So, so where does works fall into this? Because that's going to be an important question in this thing. As we unpack this, this book, and, and most of the day is, is homework for you. Galatians chapter 1. Read it. I'm just giving you the context to read it today. That's a little different for us, but that's how we're rolling today on chapter 1. Sure. So where, where, where does Christian action come into this? Like where does work 
from any of this. Because this is important. Like living as a Christian, acting as a Christian, doing the work, that's important. Right, so where does it come into play? So after we finish Galatians, we'll look at the book of James. Right? Because that's, those are two awesome books to look at together. Right? But you won't understand works until you understand grace. Here's how we operate. Right? Let's say I bought this, this beautiful plant, this beautiful flowering plant in here. And let's say I placed it right here. And I said, when you give your life to Jesus, you're like this beautiful plant. Blooms everywhere. Beautiful. Like people would come by and they'd be like, oh, where'd you get that? That's gorgeous. And you would say, well, my great great grandmother's plant. I replanted it. It's beautiful. And you took time and you put the seed in and it took time and it grew and the blooms on it were like, bam, gorgeous. And you just set it out there, but you neglected it. You didn't water it. You didn't give it any sunlight. You just set it out there. <laughs> if you've been to my house in the last two weeks, you saw one of those plants on the front, <laughs> front steps. <laughs> right brown. <laughs> but let's say you neglected it, and those buds just <laughs> kind of shriveled up. Here's what we do. Here's how we live as Christians. We take our life, this, this, beautiful, this thing that was so beautiful and Jesus was just popping everywhere and people could be around you and they would be like, I see Jesus in that person. But then we neglect Jesus and we, we kind of let sin take over and we don't look so beautiful. You know what we do with Christian works? We say, well, there's a beautiful plant over there and we take a bud and we cut it off and we tape it to our plant. <laughs> And we see another one, and we staple it to our plant. And we put all these beautiful buds, because they're beautiful. We want people to see that we've got beautiful blood, buds. And we just attach them to the deadness that's going on in our lives. But what's going to happen to those buds? They're going to die because they're not connected to the vine. And Christian life and grace, what Paul's about to unpack in this book, is... Stop going around and looking for all the other things to make yourself look pretty. And pay attention to the root of the issue. And the root of the issue is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing but that. How are you and Jesus doing today? Are you enjoying Him? Because he designed that relationship for you to enjoy him. And if you just grab and work and stake it to your life, you're missing out on the beauty. Nurture and pay attention to the bloom and the plant and the vine that is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And then guess what? When you do that, you start budding. You start popping. These works will come and you're not even looking. I talked to a lady this week and, and we talked about this, this thing that had happened into her life and, and somebody had come and, and she'd been able to have this relationship with and point to Jesus and she was like, you know, two years ago I quit my job and I was just praying. I was like, God, where do you want me? What do you want me to do? I just, I've got this love for you and I want to know where to use it. And she was like, I never really received a, a solid answer, but for the last two years God's just been sending people my way that I could pour into Because I'm focusing on my relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm blue. Paul says, don't let another gospel distract you. Verses 4 through 6. Go back and read. Don't let another gospel distract you. This is all about Jesus and only about Jesus. And you have a Father who loves you at this moment, right now, no matter what you've done, it's not about your accomplishment. It's about how much He loves you. And He is looking and waiting for you to come home. Let's pray. Lord, that you would be our delight. And that as we dive into this book over the next few Sundays, that scales would be removed from our eyes and hardness would be removed from our heart and we would see that you love us in a way that is not comparable with anyone or anything else. And that we are yours and you are the joy of our life. And Father, that nothing would get in the way of that. 
We ask these things in Jesus' name. And church, if that's your prayer, say amen. 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 Let's stand and let's sing together. Grace alone. Amen. 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 Amen.